Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the Crucible's Virtual Artist Talk. My name is Alyssa Stone. I am the Director of Programs at the Crucible, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our sixth, seventh Virtual Artist Talk. I can't even keep track. Who even knows anymore? Time is irrelevant. Um, I am so excited that you are joining us on this beautiful Friday afternoon. I hope you are all well and safe. Um, I want to give a couple introductions about The Crucible before we welcome our speaker today, Nico Chen. I'm sure most of you are familiar, but just in case you're not, The Crucible uh, has, since 1999, been an important cultural arts organization and community in the Bay Area. We serve more than 5,000 students a year, work with over 45 local schools offering classes, workshops, and site visits, and have the pleasure of introducing so many students to the transformative power and confidence building experience of making art. Over 20,000 people each year interact with our classes and programs, with 64% of the young people we serve receiving financial aid to participate. For many, the Crucible is the industrial arts education school in the Bay Area, known for high quality teaching and a vibrant artist community. However, since COVID-19 erupted in our area, the Crucible has had to cancel or postpone more than 230 classes and programs. We are working to bring some of the magic of the Crucible online, including this virtual artist talk today. We are going to get through this, and we are asking our community to help support us by becoming a member, purchasing a gift certificate, donating directly, or buying art directly from our faculty, which you can do online at thecrucible.org. We encourage you throughout the talk to send questions you have for Nico to us privately or in the public chat function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. There will be time for me to read them towards the end of our talk today. So pop on over to that chat uh, and say hello where you're watching from um, and add any questions that you have for Nico. I will ask them at the end of our talk today. Um, I want to thank a couple of staff or all of our staff for helping to make these programs possible and a few special um, staffers who've helped to make these uh, function today. A big shout out to Natasha Von Canel and um, Kathy Nyland, our marketing duo, who've helped to make these talks possible. A big thanks to our executive director, Susan Murnett, CFO Renee Ventimiglia, director of operations and studio facilities, Kula Patton, and uh, the rest of our staff and faculty who have been incredible members of our Crucible community through this challenging situation. Today we are speaking with Nico Chen, and I'm very excited to welcome him to our virtual artist talk today. Nico first joined the Crucible community as our Fuego coordinator, working with our teen leadership program during the summers. Nico is a PhD student in the teaching and learning department department at NYU Steinhardt School. He is a critical learning scientist seeking to use design-based research with the purpose of re-envisioning the English language, uh, English language learners as multilingual, multicultural makers or M3s through linguistically responsive teaching, culturally responsive teaching, and maker-centered learning. In embarking on this research, Nico wants to empower teachers to design with the whole child in mind. In embarking on this research, Nico wants to empower teachers his research also encompasses the topics of arts-centered integrated learning, critical literacy, pedagogical language knowledge, teacher burnout, and teacher identity. In the past, Nico uh, worked as an English language arts teacher in Oakland and as an international educator in a variety of projects in Kazakhstan, Myanmar, China, Taiwan, and Senegal. His forte is in designing learning environments with an emphasis on creativity, English language acquisition, critical thinking, and cross-cultural empathetic communication. That is a mouthful, if I do say so myself. Um, and I'm very grateful that Nico will actually be talking more about these topics and not me. So with that, please join me in a warm virtual welcome to Nico Chen. 
Hello world. Um, I did not realize how long that bio actually sounded. It looks very short on paper, but then when Alyssa actually read it, I realized I needed- Those are, those are words with a lot of letters in them. Um, Nico, I am so excited that you are our featured um, artist talk speaker today. I find so much inspiration and joy in the work that you do with The Crucible. Um, and so I want to jump right in and get started. Your art practice really influences your professional work as an educator. And we'll talk a little bit more about your specific art practice in a second. But what drew you towards the field of arts education? I mean, for myself, I think art is such a liberating activity. Like when I feel very, very free when I get to work with my hands and my thoughts. And so I feel like the best, most potent classrooms is when you see that the kids are engaged and excited from their own capacity, where they have choice and they have excitement in what we are collectively doing. And so for me, like the, act, the, the activity of art um, gives us the opportunity to be passionate and engage in our work. And I think that we should integrate that as much into education as we can. I love that. You are an educator through and through and an artist in your own right. You are mostly involved with photography and writing alongside your own arts practice. Um, how did you first get involved in photography and writing? Of course, um, so I started photography as a very, um, I mean, I got really excited about photography when I started um, teaching abroad. And so my first opportunity in teaching abroad was in Beijing back in, I believe like, gosh, um, to 1998, I believe was when the economic crisis happened. And so I moved right after, which was about 1999. And I moved to China to teach English between 2009 and 2011. And within this, completely new culture. I just really wanted to get to know what the culture was all about. I couldn't quite put the words to what was going on. And photography was a way to make meaning and make sense of what was going on around me. And so by capturing these moments and then com coming back to these moments and trying to sort of make sense of what these images were saying to me and understanding why I was interested in taking these images really allowed me to get to know the culture a little bit better. Um, having a camera um, also drew me to talk to a lot of new people and to try to, you know, negotiate um, a space where we find trust in each other, where, you know, I'm not just a photographer at trying to capture subjects, but I'm trying to um, create this um, conversation, even though there is a language barrier. And so for me, um, learning photography and learning language was sort of in the same camp of like learning how to communicate through both arts and also through a new language that I was learning. Well, thank you. What do you hope to communicate through your work? I think that oftentimes when we are going through our day-to-day -day lives, we sort of forget to look, to look closely at things. And so for me, photography is an opportunity to be completely curious about the world. And so when I am going through my day, sometimes, sometimes, you know, just doing my everyday work, I tend to forget to look, but then with a camera in hand, going into that flow state of curiosity, I tend to be able to tap into the curious natures of my own students through photography to be able to, um, sort of see things through a more uh, youthful eye. And so in my photography, I want to sort of communicate the sort of curiosity that comes through when we are able to look closely at things and to start to um, want to dive into our, our settings in a very curious way. Curiosity is so important in art and certainly in education, of course, which you're very familiar with. Um, yeah. And I also think, oh. yeah, go ahead, Nico. Oh, and I also think that sometimes um, when we are taking photographs and we are choosing the photographs to share with other people, we are also sharing sort of like this, over this resonance that we experienced during that time, that, that moment of like excitement or insight or even a moment of change that we experience um, while experiencing these things in our everyday lives. 
nowadays almost everyone has a camera on their phone to capture every inch of life. Um, what is your chosen equipment? So in the past, I have worked with DSLR cameras and I would say that having lost my expensive equipment due to, you know, thefts or due to just breaking it quite a few times, I've noticed that the best camera that is around me is probably my phone. And actually, part of my practice, part of my uh, photo photographic practice is to be able to share the photographs with the world through um, this immediate um, sharing through social media, but also immediate journaling as captioning through, through the camera. So my phone for me is my favorite tool um, because I can also um, look up sort of information while I am also taking photographs. So sometimes when I'm taking a photograph of something, I'm not quite sure what that something is. It could be a plant, it could be of a um, national monument or whatever else, but I can actually have access to that information right away through my phone as well. And so sometimes when I take a photograph, it becomes this point of interest where capturing that image um, and wanting to have that image to have more resonance is to also learn about what, it, what I am capturing at the same time. And how do you determine your subjects? Is there a line between photo documentation and photo artistry or does it blend together for you? I would say that when I go back to my photographs, a lot of them seem to feel like documents because it's like, oh, there's this interesting thing. Let me show you this interesting thing. And so I think when it comes to showing interesting things, that can be a bit more of a documentation thing. However, when it comes to looking back at my photos from eight, eight years back, two months back, three months back, um, the pieces that I feel like has more artistry really brings out sort of a, a more of a resonance that I would say um, has a sort of feeling of a practice of freedom. And when I talk about a practice of freedom, it's sort of like when you look at a piece of art, it's not just, oh, that art piece is this plant or that art piece is this um, representation of this urn. It's more like, what does this thing have, what meaning does this piece bring out for me? And so I think it has this sort of meaning making process that brings out this agency within people to inquire, to be curious about that thing and to inquire even further about what that thing is. And so that resonance uh, and that practice of freedom to push people to be inspired to learn more about what is going on or to feel this thing for themselves and understand what, why this has such potent meaning for themselves is what for me becomes more of an art piece. You also create origami art. How were you introduced to this art form and what meaning does it hold for you? So the first time I participated in origami um, in a collaborative space was when I took my students from Oakland International High School to the um, Oakland Museum of California. And they had this beautiful um, exhibition about migration. And one of the activities was to take origami paper and to fold butterflies out of this origami paper. And I remembered a lot of my kids in the previous galleries, they were like, Mr. Nico, it's so boring. Like we can't do anything here. You know, like they kind of like, like you know, pushing each other around and sort of running around. But I tell them, this is a museum. We have to like, you know, be calm and collected. But then when we got to do this hands-on activity, everybody suddenly became so engaged and um, we started talking about like, what are the symbolic meanings behind this butterfly that we're making? Like, um, why does this making activity of making a butterfly have resonance to this, um, this theme of migration? And my, my students started talking to me about their own migration experiences of how they have migrated from their home countries to the United States. Um, they started, stories started flowing out and I just started to realize, wow, well, like, there's this potency when you are making things together and creating meaning together through a shared making activity. Much of your artistic work centers around the stories of people you encounter during your travels and in your education realm as well. Do you start with a vision for the stories you're after or do the stories naturally unfurl along the journey? 
I would say um, it goes hand in hand. So sometimes, you know, I start with just looking around my space and I start to notice some patterns that I'm very, very interested in. And so obviously that could be, wow, look at this person on this horse with his two amazing dogs. I want to get to know who this person is. And getting to know that person, I start to engage with the story of that person a whole lot more. Or it could just be, oh, look at this amazing building. Um, it seems like it's, it's coming out of nowhere. It seems to be this colonial building in the middle of this like jungle in the Southeast Asian country. So I wanted to like dig a little bit more deeper into that object. So once again, I think when I'm taking photos, there are certain photos that come through with this resonance of curiosity and wanting to get to know more and spurring on that agency to find that story behind what is creating this resonant experience for me. With such a naturally artistic eye, do you ever have a chance to truly unwind or is every experience potentially an artistic venture? Um, I would say that right now, for me at least, um, photography is this moment where I just get into a flow state. And so being able to see a beautiful place and wanting to capture that beautiful space is that time when I just get to like not have to talk to people and just unwind in my own sort of like artistic fervor. And I would say that um, when people think about unwinding, they think about being at a beach and sort of relaxing and sort of just like being in that space and, you know, just allowing myself to open myself up to that space and observe that space. And photography for some reason allows me to open up that channel. And so the unwinding happens in that flow state when suddenly like everything seems magical and I want to capture just about everything. And tell us about the intersection of language and photo in your work. Cause they, to me, they go seamlessly hand in hand. <laughs> so when people talk about language, people usually think about how language is text, language is spoken. But I also think that the visual text is so, so potent because what happens is when we are talking to each other, we are creating these visual things in each other's head. So if I'm giving you a sentence, um, I'm trying to push into your brain an image. But what happens um, through language, through spoken language, is that my sentence might bring up a to totally different image from your image. So if I say the man is walking down the street, the man in my head versus the man in your head um, might look completely different. The street that is in my head and the street that is in your head might be completely different. And so for me, photography is this sort of um, expressive um, sentence almost. And so when I take a photo, it's this expressive sentence where visually um, we get a very similar image. Um, and so for me, photography is this discourse where the image is very clear. We're actually going to get a chance to look at some of your pieces now. Um, and we did touch a little bit on origami earlier. Uh, you're going to lead us in an origami demo towards the end of our talk today. Um, but before we get to that, I'd love to actually dive into some of your work and have you talk to us about um, your, your process. Um, so Natasha, our director of uh, marketing and e-commerce, is going to help by showing a couple pieces on our shared screen. Um, we're going to take a look at two of your uh, works that, that you um, are particularly proud of. Um, one is, when is it right to break a law? Um, could you tell us a little bit about this piece and, and what was the vision behind it and the process that you used to capture these works? Sure. So um, the first piece actually is called Propaganda. And so when you talked about the intersection between image and language, I think that this sort of um, collage, this collage of, um, on the left you see a picture of a soldier in front of Forbidden Palace in Beijing. And on the picture on the right you see a, I mean, um, I think he was a homeless person. I didn't quite get to engage with him during that time because he was sort of in this quiet and napping repose, but he was napping in front of this very hip club in Beijing called Propaganda. And so for me, um, this, these two images hold so much language within it. You know, like 
what is the Chinese government trying to present? What is sort of the discourse that they are trying to push towards the audience versus the discourse that is happening to the right? And so sometimes when I look at photographs and also the resonance that happens in each photograph, I'm also asking what is the discourse that is happening within each photograph? And so obviously um, the Chinese government is showing sort of this, um, this authoritative power in sort of the way they created the space so that when you walk into the Forbidden Palace, you feel like, oh, there is, you know, this legacy of power that I'm walking into and it's being protected by these soldiers, right? And so we have this idea of, um, okay, so there's government propaganda that is handled in this way. There is a word that has a certain tone and meaning in this way. But to the right, we have sort of a subversion of the word propaganda. So we have this hip club in Beijing that is frequented by expatriates and really hip college students. And so they have this sort of critical lens of what prop propaganda is. And for me, um, when I think about what is happening in our, our current world, um, when, it, when it comes to the coronavirus and you know Trump calling uh, the coronavirus the Chinese virus, he's also creating a discourse about how we should see China. And, this work to be able to, um, to, what's the word, to juxtapose these two images, I wanted to sort of show how, yes, there is Chinese propaganda coming from the Chinese government. Yes, there is our um, perception of the Chinese government coming from our own government. But then there is also like a lot of other discourses, all these other Chinese identities that also exist that we don't really think about when we think about China. And so, perhaps this juxtaposition of these two images can allow us to question the, um, the discourses that are presented by um, the Chinese government or the US government and to perhaps step into um, these um, discourses ourselves with our own curiosity, with our own questioning, with our own criticality, and to be able to look at the, multi, uh, the multifaceted nature of countries um, beyond the government, beyond the, um, beyond the um, media images that we constantly are um, bombarded with. Thank you for sharing that work. Um, you have another piece that you are going to talk to us about. Um, could you share uh, your next photo essay with us and, and give us a little bit of insight um, on how this piece came about? Of course, so these pieces are actually artifacts from my classroom. So I worked at Oakland International High School um, for three years prior to my PhD studies. And just to give you some background information about Oakland International High School, it is a community of learners where most of my students who are at the ninth and 10th grade level have been in the US for less than two years. And so a lot of them, actually all of them are recent immigrants. We have students from 33 countries who speak 12 different languages. So we are a very diverse plurilingual um, learning um, community. And during this time, it was also the time when Donald Trump was talking about how, I mean, his, his discourse on immigrants is not something that I wanna go into very deeply right now. But for me, I wanted to figure out how would I respond as a teacher to teach my students about arguments of writing about the law while the president is telling them that they should not be in this country, that they are breaking the law, that they are under our sort of discourse of law considered to be illegal. And so I wanted to design a, um, design a unit that really, really, really um, engages our students with their own agency, with their own capacity to be critical. And a lot of the time when we teach critical thinking, um, I think sometimes we have the tendency to focus on all the negative. So like all the negative things that are happening in the discourse of Donald Trump, I don't think was a helpful thing to just push my kids into because um, Maria Popova, um, uh, the blogger of Brain Picking, she says, you know, critical thinking uh, needs to be coupled with hope. You know, like we can't just teach crit critical thinking because what happens is when you teach critical thinking without hope, it leads to cynicism. Whereas if you teach hope without critical thinking, it leads to like this naivete. So I wanted to figure out how to couple both hope and critical thinking. And so when it comes to teaching students about when is it right to break the law, um, it was not just about like teaching about the law and what they should follow through in order to survive in this country. I think we want to do more than survive, we want to thrive, right? 
And so, um, Asha, can you go back to the first picture from that photo series? So the one with the three. Um, so a lot of the time when we are teaching about law, we tend to stay in what we call an ontology of um, how should one live? So how should one follow the law and be an abiding citizen, right? But um, I think the magic of this activity was I got to engage students with a totally different ontology, which is the ontology of like, how might one live? And so instead of just talking about what should we be doing, we are actually talking about what could we be doing? You know, what um, could happen? What, um, what I would do? And so we look at the law um, not as this sort of static monolithic thing that has been around forever, but we are, I, I'm teaching students about these different situations such as Loving versus Virginia, where um, a black woman and a white man got married against the Virginia law and had to flee to Washington DC and you know, get a marriage license. Um, I talked about sort of the California sanctuary laws versus like what is going on in the discourse in, Wa uh, in Washington DC. Uh, we talked about um, the gun laws that happen, uh, the gun laws and also what happened in the Florida school shootings. And so students get to grapple with these real life situations and they can come forth with their own agency in deciding, you know, like I think this person was right to break the law or this person might have done these other things. And so opening up the classroom space, not as a place of what you should do or what you should not do in that sort of authoritarian teaching style, but rather to open up the space to make a democratic forum happen through not only arguments to writing, but also writing letters to our civic leaders, um, making these protest signs so that we can um, sort of post these protest signs around the classroom to see what, what does our community of learning actually think about this topic. And for me, like it was a transformative teaching experience because a lot of the time I'm so focused on standards but then I started to realize, you know, like my living question for myself as a teacher is how do we intersect not only the, not, not only think about the academic standards, but how do we um, intersect creativity and community into, um, into academic rigor as well? Thank you for sharing all that. I, I mean, for me, I always think that the arts are the tip of the sword of advocacy. I think that we are able to message progress and um, community needs through art in a very powerful and meaningful way. And what you do helps to hone that in young people. Um, I wanna change gears slightly and talk a little bit about your relationship with the Crucible. Um, you are, of course, a staff member with us. Um, you've been with us for almost a year now um, as our Fuego coordinator. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about your experience with the Crucible and how you first became involved? Of course, so I mean, the job at the Crucible is absolutely phenomenal. I get to work with these 12 amazing bright artists. And um, my own experience in coming to, um, my, my own experience with the Crucible is um, I actually, it was kind of a serendipitous moment. It was Christmas time. I needed to buy something for my mom. So my friend was like, hey, there's this gift thing that's happening. There's all these amazing artisans. Why don't you come with me to get some gifts for your mom? And so I walked into this amazing industrial art space where everybody was just like so engaged with this industrial art that they were working on. I like got to meet all these amazing artisans who sort of like, um, you know, when you walk into an art space, sometimes um, you're sort of like distance from the actual art. You're sort of standing like five feet back, but I got to sort of um, touch things and like interact with people and actually touch the um, actual art objects and just see sort of like, how art can be such an embodied and exciting thing where people are empowered with their hands. And so I was introduced um, to the Crucible through that, um, through that amazing event. And I wanna go back every single year. <laughs> and so I saw that job listing on the Crucible when I was looking for a summer job and I was like, this is perfect. I wanna be able to like learn more about this amazing, amazing space. And so, um, and I always wanted to take a class there too. So, um, so, the Fuego program, I think, um, is this sort of opportunity for students to not only progress in their artistic um, capacities, but to also learn how to be leaders 
and also learn how to collaborate. And so we have um, glass flame blowers, we have, um, we have welders, we have leather workers. And so sometimes when you are confined in your own discipline, there is sort of a, um, a set repertoire of things that you usually make. But then when our student our students get together and I actually get them to, uh, there's this wonderful little activity that I have them do where they, um, they do a speed dating activity where it's like, how can you possibly collaborate through, uh, through your disciplines? How can your disciplines kind of go like this? Like what's the baby that you will produce from your disciplines and seeing like suddenly they break out of the confinements of their disciplines and figure out, okay, like I'm a welder. How do I work with this leather worker in order to like create something completely new? Like, and we, um, we came up with these amazing chimerical ideas that people just don't really come to their discipline with, but they are able to um, um, co-create and co-construct when they are working together collaboratively. How does your background as an artist um, support your work as an educator in this industrial arts setting? So I would say that um, I am not an industrial artist myself. <laughs> so. Um, so I actually came into making um, pretty late because I usually work with um, more of um, poetic art forms and um, visual art forms. And so my background comes from sort of trying to figure out what the meaning is through text, um, through speaking, through, um, through figuring out sort of the artist statement of what I'm producing. And so for me, I, um, I am bringing to the, the, the table sort of that expertise. And then we have all these different experts in the room um, in the Fuego program where I have no idea what each discipline is, right? And so since our teen leaders are um, prepping to um, assist their, their teachers in their discipline, I... As, as a completely new learner of all of these disciplines, they have to explain what's going on to me. And so they're practicing with me as a learner. I'm just like, well, if I step into the glass blowing room, what should I be aware of? I, I know nothing. <laughs> and so coming from this sort of space where I am openly curious, I sort of frame myself as a new student for them. We do these practice runs and they understand sort of like because I have these holes in understanding what they need to do, what, what their teaching capacity needs to be, what their leadership capacity needs to be in order to be able to support other students. And so it's sort of like, um, and, and on, the, on the other end, I guess my expertise is like, I look at their object and, they're, and I'm just sort of like, oh, you created this wonderful object that's beautiful. What does it mean? And they're like, it's cool. I really like making it. And so pushing them to sort of engage with like, the languaging, the sort of meaning making, um, the sort of poetry of what they're making is what I bring um, into the space. And so it's a collaborative, co-constructed and um, mutually um, beneficial space where we are all learning from each other. And what are ways that you bring your artistic practice and your education practice into your work with the Fuego team leaders? So I would say that sometimes my, my, what has succeeded in my classroom, I have been trying to bring that in and it's a trial and error sort of thing. <laughs> some things work really, really well and some things don't work all that well. So one thing that I like to do with my students is, um, you know, with my advisory students is they bring something from their home and we create this classroom altar space. And we get to know each other through these items that, um, that's, that resonate with us, that sort of reveal a part of who we are. And so what I brought into the Fuego space um, that worked was also this altar space. And so I asked students to all bring in their, their objects that they are proud of making into the space and sharing that object into the space. Um, I also love drawing and writing. And so um, that's a big part of my traditional classroom space. And so what, I, what, what we also did was um, we did another speed dating activity where all of these students had their objects in front of them. And then the people had to add, the people had to um, go, um, go do their space and ask them a question and create a page in their zine that shows an illustration and also a little caption that captures um, the answer to the question that they asked the artist. And so um, letting, so, so what, I, what I have been bringing in is sort of um, this 
the, the, the forum, the questioning forum, that art does not exist in this vacuum. It's not just you made this thing because it's cool, but you want to share your art with others. You want to sort of like um, be able to learn how to communicate um, what your stance is as an artist or what you are trying to communicate through your art piece, through this open questioning forum space and also to get to know a community of artists. So doing these team building activities, such as um, we do um, the, uh, the, the, the tower making activity with, um, with that, that marshmallow on top, where we, you have to negotiate like team building without speaking, <laughs> right? How, how do you negotiate that? Uh, and, so, and so these are the things I've been bringing in, into the, uh, the Fuego Youth Leadership Program. Yeah, and you do an amazing job leading our bright, burgeoning, young leader artists. Um, you yourself are earning a PhD. Um, we don't have a ton of time to talk about your work at NYU, but I was wondering if you could maybe in a couple sentences tell us a little bit about what you're studying and, and what your research is focusing on. Of course. So um, my current research focus is on language related knowledge for teachers of English language learners. And so we call it dialogical teaching <laughs> our, our dialogic teaching where when we are engaging um, students in questioning, it shouldn't be well. When we engage students in questioning, we often fall into this pattern of what we call initiation, response, evaluation. So I ask you a question, you respond with what you think is the right answer, and then I evaluate whether or not your answer was correct or wrong. But we want to figure out ways to design questioning, design language around the classroom so that the, um, the teacher gives the students the space of possibility to openly interrogate that on their own, to not just say, oh, that's right or that's wrong, let me give you the right answer. Because that honestly, I think, steals the struggle for the students. And within that struggle is really the learning opportunity. How do we get students to engage comfortably with the struggle so that they can grow from finding the answers for themselves? That's beautiful. Um, speaking of questions, and hopefully not too many struggly questions, I definitely wanted to remind all of our listeners that if you have questions for Nico, um, that you can pop them over into the chat and I will read them at the end of our talk together. Um, uh, I, I want to shift now into your art practice currently, um, and then help us move into your demo that you're going to be doing um, with us today around origami. Um, so, Nico, um, we're going to skip, I think, the section on the small stories just for time's sake. Um, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what you're doing currently in the shelter in place time for your own creative practice. Of course. And so, I, for, for myself, I've been taking time um, away from my working space once in a while just to like engage with photography. So. I just recently went through finals <laughs> and so I had this like mental mush, you know, like this sort of panic of like, oh gosh, I have to write 50 pages in 10 days. And sometimes when we have this pressure within our brains of like, oh gosh, I have to produce, 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 writing, 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 we tend to forget that um, our souls start to sing when we are actually engaged in artistic practice. And so what I've been doing during the shelter in place is I've been writing these small stories. So I force myself to at least, you know, take one photograph a day just to take a break, but to also engage with the photograph's resonance and also what I've been learning through the languaging during this new shelter in place um, sort of um, jurisdiction of like, um, you should keep six feet apart or like, what does that mean in my own daily life and um, documenting, but also creating a little story out of that to complement the photograph. And um, to transition into today's activity, I want to just quickly prelude this with um, the story of my mental mush. And so during the first two or three weeks of shelter in place, I remember just feeling this intense writer's block. I'm just sort of like, oh my God, what is happening in the world? How do I deal? <laughs> and I remember not struggling too much with most of the coursework, but whenever I would need to start writing, I would just hit this wall. And when I hit this wall, I would just be super duper frustrated. And I would just like need to lay down. 
And when I would lay down, I would just like listen to those podcasts and try to like escape with the podcast, like stories um, or um, news or whatsoever. But then there was this one podcast that I listened to. Um, it was a conversation between Krista Tippett and Ocean Wong. And Ocean Wong was talking about, you know, the idea of the writer's block. And he talks about how writer's block is not really a thing. He talks about how it's actually a mythos of capitalism that we are sort of like, in this mental loop of like, we're supposed to be producing and we have this anxiety to be productive in our writing. And we are quantifying our self-worth through like our page counts, our word counts, right? And so we're hitting this dead end and we are in this like confined, um, confined writer's block of like, why am I not producing any work? And he talks about how like, you know, when you are hitting a dead end in your writing, you actually need to turn away and get away from your desk. That writing is not just this mental process like um you know descartes talks about i think therefore i am but that is misconstrued like we are thinking but also feeling and caring beings and if we are not feeling and caring then we will stay stuck in our sort of mental mental blocks and so he talks about how you know if you're hitting a writer's block it means that something is not happening it doesn't mean that you're blocked perhaps you should start walking because <laughs> sometimes when you are given given the chance to sort of walk around your space, you are moving with your bodies. And sometimes that by moving your body, that is how you um, are able to have your ideas flow a little bit better, you know? Um, and so I was thinking to myself, gosh, like I am sheltered in place right now. I can't afford to go outside and walk because I don't have a mask yet. How do I like spur this, you know, like the, this flow of ideas through my body if I cannot, um, cannot go outside. And so, mm -hmm. Um, after a lot of trial and error, <laughs> I've come to sort of this idea of how to sort of reorient and reshape or uh, reframe your working space so that it can become a more creative space where the ideas can flow. And so um, for, the, for those of you who are um, listening from home, um, I would get started um, if you want to, just to find three things around your room or your house that um, that has resonance with you, that, that, that can bring um, joy into sort of your working space. And so um, while you're doing that, I can show you the three things that I found around my space that um, bring in some joy and resonance into my working space. And so the first piece I'd like to show everybody is this, um, this beautiful coral piece from Taiwan and this rock from Taiwan as well. Um, this coral piece, um, gives me great memories of me and my partner swimming near a small island off the coast of Taiwan in the day that we um, swam with 15 enormous sea turtles. <laughs> and also like this rock is from, um, from Beide Mountain, which is the highest mountain in Taiwan and um, me hiking with a great friend of mine. Um, and so for me, like these two natural pieces really gives me sort of the sense of serenity um, and, and brings that into my, my workspace. Uh, another thing that brings me joy is this wonderful book by uh, Rainer Maria Rilke called um, Letters to a Young Poet. Whenever I feel blocked, sometimes just reading his beautiful writing helps me engage with my more poetic side, philosophical side of writing. And I also um, brought in another piece that brings me joy, which is this origami paper. Um, and so when we are sort of Surrounded by these creative pieces. Ooh, you've got your pieces, Alyssa. I love it. I love it. So sometimes when I am stuck, I sort of think about, okay, so what's the narrative behind being stuck? Gosh, I like can't focus. I can't focus. And so, you know, sometimes holding on to these objects, you know, when I'm holding on to um, this piece of coral, I sort of try to um, reframe sort of that story of like, gosh, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. How do I reframe it so that it, it can push me towards a more positive space. I see how Rebecca also has her pieces. And so like sort of think, think about the narratives that make you feel stuck in your creativity, but how do, how do these items bring in sort of that resonance to reframe that? And so when I hold on to this um, curl piece, instead of saying, I can't focus, I can't focus, you know, holding onto this piece and breathing a little bit more deeper, you know, the words that actually flows through my body when I listen to my body, I think, oh gosh, I can focus, I've got this, I, I can focus, I've got this. And this is not just a thought that you wanna reframe in your brain, but you want to actually write it down on a piece of paper and just kind of put it up to the side of your desk. And whenever you feel stuck, 
just breathe deeply and sort of look at this message that this um, item has uh, brought in resonance for you. Um, another piece that I want to share when I am feeling stuck is obviously the origami folding. And it's gonna be hard for me to go step by step because of the lack of time that we have. So I'm just going to um, go straight to the poetry reading. But um, reading poetry sometimes also helps me um, engage my entire body. And when I talk about reading poetry, it's not just letting the text stick to the paper and just read it like this and have it in your brain, but to actually read the poetry aloud so that you're engaging with like your vocal cords. And sometimes um, when we are feeling super duper lonely or super duper stuck while sheltered in place, it's because our bodies are not moving. And so I'm going to read this poem aloud while folding this sheet of origami um, uh, to sort of um, engage us with sort of how this creative flow can help us um, unlock, unlock when we feel stuck. And, and so um, you have talked about this as a way to reframe your workspace as a creative space. So finding ways to take these objects, take these memories and meaningful items and kind of bringing them into your space to take what would otherwise be four very confining walls and finding the expansiveness outside of them. Of course, yeah. And for me, like I, when, when we are working, we are in what's called a focused sort of mode of thinking. And so when we are so focused on something, sometimes we forget that we have to take that break so that our brains can have a time to just um, do what we call diffuse thinking. And creative thinking actually comes more readily when we are giving our brain that time to relax and engaging our bodies so that these thoughts start to bounce around our brains. These synapses actually start to communicate with each other because Sometimes when you're focused thinking, it's just using one part of this brain constantly and you're not engaging with the other thoughts that might um, make connections. And so sometimes when you allow yourself that moment of quiet, of like of making with your hands, you engage with the um, diffuse thinking that can expand the, uh, the creativity that should be able to just flow through your body. Once again, you know, Descartes talks about, I think, therefore I am. But when you are constantly just like in a focused way of thinking, you're not actually um, listening to your body. And so I have reframed that to like, I feel, therefore I am. So when I am making, when I am giving myself time to, um, um, to sit with the resonance of these objects that I have brought into my space to reframe this creative space, um, I, I'm allowed to feel a little bit more and the words um, flow out rather than forced out. So while I'm folding this, I would like to read, um, a beautiful poem by David Yezzy. Um, so, paper creased is with a touch made less by half reduced as much. Again, by a second fold, so the wish to press our designs can diminish what we hold. But by your hand's careful work, I understand how this unleaving mix of what's before something finer and finally, more. Now, when I finish a poem, um, I don't immediately just go to the question, what does this poem mean? <laughs> I think that like a lot of the time we tend to revert back to our, um, our focus thinking and try to find the answer to things. And I think that like, once again, that's the initiation response evaluation of a lot of um, education, which is like, we're looking for the right answer. But when I, when I read poetry, I think about like, how does this resonate with me? So I usually start with just a noun. And the first noun of this poem is paper. So I'm gonna um, just reread the first stanza. Paper creased is with a touch made less by half reduced as much. So that word paper, when I think about how it resonates with this moment in my life, I think of paper as sort of that um, empty, ape eight and a half by 11 um, digital sheet of paper on my Word document. And I'm just like, why can I not get any words on this piece of paper? <laughs> why is it that it's still empty and not, you know, not, why are my thoughts not able to like congeal onto this paper, right? So a, a lot of the time when we think about paper, we think about like this empty sheet where um, our thoughts are meant to reside or some information is meant to reside. And then when I, when I um, string that with the, with the verb, paper creased, 
Um, and we go on to the next line, paper creases with a touch made less by half. Okay, so paper crease, paper could also, you know, talk about my, the paper that I'm chasing through this PhD program, right? So that, that paper is, you know, a certificate that says Nico Chen, PhD in teaching and learning. And you don't want to crease that paper, it loses its value, <laughs> right? If you crease that paper. Very different from origami. <laughs> Very different from origami. But then when I think about, you know, the folding of this piece of paper in my hand of origami, there's an intentional creasing. It's not just this accidental creasing of these outside forces, um, forcing sort of like what we can um, interpret as mistakes, but rather this, um, this creative act where we can pre-plan our folds. And so as we go on to the next stanzas, you know, like um, makes us, the last stanza makes us, um, makes of what's before something finer and finally more. It allows me to engage with the idea that, you know, Sometimes when we are feeling stuck by sort of pushing our designs into this other form of art, so we have this little crane. And um, so actually that poem's title was called Crane. <laughs> um, so Natasha, can you do me a favor? Can you um, help me, help me um, put up the last slide for small stories? So when I was writing, I remember just thinking like, gosh, like how do I get my thoughts on paper in a cogent way? And this, um, the action of actually folding origami cranes really helped with the diffuse thinking. And so I'm just gonna read this out loud, in my, um, out loud to everyone. Um, so in my head, I'm thinking, I think therefore I am. So during finals, I'm like writing, citing, coding, editing, and reorganizing paragraphs, ideas, artifacts, tables, and concepts. Halfway through this process, I realized I need to turn towards poetry and philosophy, movement and voice. I say aloud to myself, I feel who I am. I think, feel, care, and find moments when my paragraphs express rather than, than espouse. Also, folding cranes calms my writing nerves. There's almost a hundred of them now, helping me fold my thoughts into cogent words. And so the allowance of giving myself that creative space of just relaxing my brain, not looking at the screen, folding cranes actually allows me to put my thoughts together in that moment of um, activating my hands in something creative. And from that small action, I'm actually able to be creative in my work. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you, Nico. Thank you for that poetry reading and for making origami on the fly, a beautiful <laughs> And I'm um, sorry I couldn't do the step-by-step, -step, but um, I do know that if you just YouTube crane folding um, on your YouTube, you will find hundreds of videos. If you don't have any origami paper, I would say like just take a magazine that you have at home, browse through that magazine and just find like a lovely little page that you think is beautiful and just cut out a six inch by six inch piece of paper and just start folding and see how, um, how your thoughts can flow through while you are um, engaged with something tactile. Allowing the hands to process. <laughs> exactly. But, but the world is in our hands, but also like you have to engage your hands to uh, engage those thoughts as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've collected up a couple questions from our uh, listeners today. And um, if you have a question for Nico, go ahead and pop it over into the chat function and I'll read it out loud. Um, we've got a couple questions to start. Um, Nico, uh, the activities you are talking about with the Fuego leaders sound really fun and intimate. How do you facilitate a space for young adults to be creative in a safe way with one another? So I think it's really important to engage the adult, the, the, the young adults with sort of, um, what do they want from the space? How do we make the space conducive to all of us, right? And so I start with sort of creative norm making. And so starting with sort of like, what does your safe space look like so that you can be creative and sharing that out and coming to sort of these shared co-constructed group, group norms so that everybody's needs for a creative space are met I think is essential and it also gives me a wonderful opportunity to get to know the needs and the um, creative um, process of my um, young adult leaders. Do you have a favorite memory of a creative moment with a Fuego youth? 
let me let me think about that for a second because there's so many creative moments that happened last year um yeah i would say that um we we had so so we we toured some of the most amazing um industrial um factories in oakland so we went to both cass and um AB and I Foundry. AB and I Foundry, thank you. That totally slipped my brain for a second. And um, we came back and we talked about what we learned from that experience. And so we, um, we did this activity called Parts, Purposes, and Complexities. And so what we did before the, the, um, before the field trip was we thought about the parts, purposes, and complexities of um, a factory recycling, um, recycling uh, different steel materials and how, how, how they um, were able to create um, new materials that we can still use. And so I, I asked them to sort of use their own phones to research and also um, use their own prior experience to sort of do this um, visual representation of what they think the parts, um, purposes and complexities of the factory is. And after we went on this field trip and seeing sort of how they are able to um, demonstrate the complexity of what they have learned from this field trip in this co-constructed um, collaborative um, drawing and labeling. Um, I remember looking at the posters and just being like, I was not able to do this at the age of our youth leaders. Like when I was 16, I had no idea what happened in factories. And so seeing how they um, understood like the complexity of uh, the different parts of the factory and also understanding like the um, the sustainability philosophy that um, that is underlying um, the practices of this factory was just this really inspirational moment where um, where I realized that teenage brains have su such a much larger capacity than I expected them to have. Uh, another question from our audience, our last question, and then we'll wrap up for our day. Um, it sounds like Zen practice informs your experiences, for example, through the focus on the choral piece. What are the main thought systems or thinkers that inform your approach to art and teaching? Oh. So I'm, it's funny that you mentioned Zen because I find meditation to be so difficult. Like I've tried meditation so many times, but I find it, um, I find myself like my body is just not able to sit still. And so for me, um, a meditation leader that I follow is Thich Nhat Hanh, who talks about meditation is not just this thing that happens when you are sitting in lotus position and, you know, quiet, but the meditation moments comes from like walking and engaging in like the, um, the wonders and the, um, and the miracle that like your feet is touching this earth or sometimes like washing dishes you know, just being aware of the moment of like the, 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 the water splashing your hand and how lovely that feels on your hand. And so, you know, through the embodied movements to be aware and to zone into like how delicious that moment can be through Thich Nhat Hanh's words really helps me reframe meditation as something that I can feel and be aware of through embodied practice. Thank you, Nico, and thank you for sharing all the multifaceted parts of an artist and educator and human that you are today. Um, I'm so glad that you were able to join us for our virtual artist talk this afternoon. Um, just to wrap up, I want to thank everyone who joined us for our virtual artist talk. And of course, thank you, Nico, for sharing your insights and artistry with us this afternoon. Um, you can check out more of Nico's work and follow him on his journey uh, on Instagram at Paths of Reverie, or you can see Nico's work at pathsofreverie.com. Um, Natasha, I think, is very kindly going to drop those into our chat so you can grab those. Um, I, I love the title Paths of Reverie as well. It's very illustrative. 
In a couple weeks, we'll be sitting down with metal sculpture artist Rob Nearing. So please stay tuned for your invitation to that. Uh, Rob was actually my predecessor at the Crucible and also an extraordinary um, welded, arti welded metal artist um, himself. So you are welcome to stick around uh, once we kind of close our artist talk and you are welcome to unmute yourself in a moment to say a hello to Nico. Before we do that, just a couple reminders. If you are able, we would appreciate your support at The Crucible. Please jump on our website, thecrucible.org, to find out about how you can support us by becoming a member, donating, purchasing a gift certificate, and checking out the extraordinary artwork that our Crucible artists have for sale to directly support our individual artists in our community um, now and in the future. We are very excited to get ourselves uh, resuming operations soon at the Crucible in a very safe uh, manner and with the community's well-being at the forefront and as our priority always. So definitely make sure that you're on our mailing list and check out thecrucible.org to learn about everything that we're doing and how we're going to welcome students back soon. With that, uh, thank you so much for joining our virtual artist talk with Nico Chen. Nico, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. And uh, we wish everyone a safe and happy Friday and we'll see you all very soon. <laughs>